All right. Is that working? You are muted. I'm not muted. Yes, you're muted. No, I'm not. I can't hear you. Any luck? I, are you sure you're not? Okay, your green thing I see. Okay, let me see if it's something on my end went blank. Yeah. Testing, testing. Can you hear me? Yay. I hear myself in my headphones. Something changed on your end. <sighs> Dang it. It all worked a minute ago. My husband just sneezed so loudly that I could hear him two stories away. <laughs> and I can't hear you a continent away. I'm I'm looking into it. Best episode ever. Yeah, the people can hear me. I can't hear you. Some way to mute oh. what I hear. Now I can hear you. Okay, now I can hear you. <laughs> I changed nothing. I changed nothing. Well, and, and sometimes doing nothing is the right thing to do. Google, you are drunk. <laughs> Go home. Go home, Google. <laughs> You're a little drunk. <laughs> yeah, we've been dealing with a few technical issues over the last uh, couple of weeks. <laughs> All right. Uh, so hello to the four <laughs> viewers that are watching us right now. Well, there's a little more than that. I, I, I set an event for this to happen, and it, uh, it, it defaulted to the wrong day. Normally, when you create an event in Google, it defaults to the to the same day, and so, but it defaulted to tomorrow. So I just. I just didn't even think, and so now, you know, the the occasional person who is going to watch this thinks it's happening tomorrow, and I apologize. Although there are probably going to be more episodes happening tomorrow, so they're not entirely wrong. It is going to be a crazy week for recording Astronomy Cast. My brain may break. Oh, this is awesome. But we're talking about an, an appropriate uh, a topic given the brain breakage that will occur as the output of astronomy cast exceeds my ability to input new information. We will reach, we will what, exceed, we will get out of equilibrium? We, we will exceed my bus rate. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so if anyone has sort of no idea what's going on here, we are recording uh, a live episode of astronomy cast. Specifically, we are recording a catch-up episode of astronomy cast. So when I start up this episode, uh, you're going to hear me say that it's episode 303 for Monday, April 22nd, uh, and that's because it's not we April are. 22nd. It's not. It's because we're about eight weeks behind. So it's June 2nd. It is June 2nd. So so we've got about six episodes to go to catch up after this, and uh, we're going to be getting a big chunk of them done today. No, sorry, this no, week, not no. today. I am, and then we're going to get a <laughs> bunch more done to kind of get ahead because you're going to be gone in July. So yeah, so we've now got our good buddy Courtney uh, is is sort of whipping us into shape, making sure that we sort of are able to manage our schedules. At even if Miss it's, Array. Yeah, even if it's at very strange times. So, yeah, all right. So, and if, if you ever want to traumatize Fraser, show him my calendar. Yeah, yeah, she's like, I'm going to share my calendar with you. And I was well, you like, were proposing all of these things. And yeah, I, was I know, just I like, know, and now you just shared your calendar, and I just, I just stared at it in shock horror <laughs> and just cried, <laughs> cried. <laughs> Oh, it's madness. <laughs> no, madness was the tornado on Friday. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, cool. So let's, uh, are, you, are you in mono-ish? 
No, that would have been intelligent. Okay. Uh, yeah, and if you want to post uh, any comments, questions, feedback, uh, we can probably answer some questions afterwards, although I will probably have to go run and parent after this. So, so um, yeah. And so this is probably going to be a very short episode. In fact, probably a lot of these sort of one-offs are going to be short episodes. Um, but we will be caught up. Yeah. Which would be great. Everybody will be happy. Nobody will be mad. Somebody wrote a really, a really sad uh, review on iTunes. It was like something. Really? It was one star, and they're like, you know, because of our bad schedule, we've destroyed all of our credibility and goodwill that we've built up. We do this for free. I know, I know. Refund in the mail. I have sent. I sent him his <laughs> refund. Um. Okay. Are you in a state of? Uh, I'm waiting for my my thing to rename to... it so that I don't copy over what we did earlier. Probably best. Yes, it's working on it. I'm it's three o three. Yes, that was what I was correcting. Good. Yeah. No, it's it's for those of you who don't know. This is something we're sharing with Fraser before all of this gets started. We've reached the point of internet celebrity, which is not the same thing as real celebrity, because real celebrities get paid. Right. We've reached right. the stage of internet celebrity where we're getting, hey, will you donate to our Kickstarter? I even had one friendly soul who had clearly no understanding of what state university professors are paid <laughs> ask if I would help buy him Google Glass. And, and no, we do this for free, and neither of us have well-paying jobs. Fraser is a journalist. I'm a state university professor. Um, so unfortunately, our need to occasionally earn a living yeah, yeah, gets in the way of her recording. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it, and it really does. I mean, you know, if we've got to buckle down and, and get through the, the, you know, the work that pays the bills, that's what we have to do. Yeah. Um, but I now have GarageBand happy. Oh, good. Okay, so you're ready to record? I am. Okay. Let's get this party started then. Okay, I'm pressing record. I am also pressing record. All right? I Can I start? So. Yes, yes, okay. you're good. All right, here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 303 for Monday, April 22nd, 2013. Equilibrium. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hi, hey, Pamela. How are you doing? I, I am doing well, but my recording just stopped. What? I have to do this again? I, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm ready. Should I stop yeah. my recording? Yeah. I, I apparently have more things open than... Audacity! Uh, Audacity really hates me. It is awesome. Awesome on every it, level. It, is, it, it, I, it no. rules and never breaks and it just... It never breaks for you. It always breaks for me. You breaks towards special, awesome. It, you have special audacity skills. Is it, that what I have? Mad audacity skills? You have mad audacity skills. I have audacity break skills. Okay. I, I think the fundamental problem is my hard drive is fuller than it would like to be. So I'm going yeah. to delete all of the things that it's sad about and empty my trash. World hunger. I wish I could delete world hunger. Wouldn't that yeah. be awesome? Yeah. Oh, put it, it in the trash. put world hunger in the trash? I wish I could do that. Empty trash. Oh, good Lord. I had apparently 11,000 items on my desktop. <laughs> how, how is that even possible? <laughs> okay. I don't know. Okay, I'm pressing record again. I am also pressing record. Wow, it's moving zippy now. Okay, okay. Uh, all apparently right. Apparently having 11,000 items on my desktop. Didn't like that. Okay, let's rock. Here we go. Are you ready? Can I do this now? Are you recording? Yes, is it yes, in mono? Can. Yes. yes? Okay. It is in mono. Yes. All right. Astronomy Cast, episode 303 for Monday, April 22nd, 2013. Equilibrium. 
Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of University Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good. So let's uh, give another shout out to the upcoming uh, Astronomy Cast Mad Marathon. Well, and CosmoQuest. Sorry, the CosmoQuest. Yeah, <laughs> Mad Marathon. It, yeah, it's the hangout a thon. Yeah. Twenty four hour hangout a thon, maybe more. Why? Why maybe more? Wasn't twenty four hours enough? And then someone thought, well, we should do thirty six because well, so, records so need to be broken. <laughs> What we're finding is there's lots of awesome people who want to support us and help raise money. And so we want to give everyone a chance to, to say their piece and give us their money. Um, that came out more bitter than intended. But it, it's one of these things where, where I'm watching fly by on my Twitter feed um, news about the U.S. president's upcoming budget. And if the budget goes through as written, um, most of the field of astronomy science education that works uh, on anything outside of the National Science Foundation that's federally funded gets defunded, which is a euphemism for we're all out of work. Right. So um, failure's not an option this time. We need to raise the money to keep all of our projects going and if we're able to surpass our goals that will allow us to hire other people that are going to be unemployed four months from now if th these budgets go through. Right. All right, so 36 hours is just a further demonstration of your willingness to suffer for in the name of space and astronomy. I, I've worked longer than that before when we had yeah. software bugs. I think you've been up for 36 hours right now. Um, it feels like it. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Well, let's get rolling with this episode then. So okay. what's the date in case people want to put that in? Oh, it is June 15, 16. We are starting at noon Eastern and going at least until Sunday at noon Eastern and possibly until midnight Fantastic. Eastern. All right. And I'm going to jump in at some point and I know various of our other space friends will be sort of showing up as well and putting on a show. So hopefully this will keep everyone entertained and keep the donations rolling. All right, so, so many of the forces in space depend on equilibrium. That point where forces perfectly balance out. It defines the shape of stars, the orbits of planets, and even the forces at the cores of galaxies. Let's take a look at how parts of the universe are in perfect balance. So, you know, if this is, I put this on the roster, and, and I don't remember why. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, admittedly, a, the list of ideas was from May 2012. Well, so well it's been a yeah, while. I tend to, yeah, I tend to, uh, I, I sort of brainstorm them, you know, 50 or 60 episodes in advance and sort of throw them at, you know, out into the show notes and then you pick and choose from, from what you like. But I think we both got kind of intrigued by the topic and then we're like, well, what does that mean to us? Right. And yeah, I, I, yes, I, I went, what type of equilibrium is it? Okay, from the, I'm talking about the band. It's a German folk metal <laughs> band, and I'm, I'm a huge fan. Uh, there's also a 2002 science fiction movie uh, about equilibrium. But no, I mean, so, so what is the classic concept of, of equilibrium? Well, I, basically, it's anything that's balanced. You can have a chemical equilibrium, which is where you have balanced numbers of reactants. Uh, you can have a gravitational equilibrium, otherwise known as a balanced seesaw. It, it's any time that the forces or chemical reactions or whatever it is, um, is balanced so that nothing is accelerating, changing, slanting, or any of those other things that lead to a state change. And I can remember being in high school and, you know, when we learned the whole section on forces and being quite surprised at, at how, you know, when you're standing on the ground and you're pushing down on the ground, that makes sense. But in fact, there is a equal and opposite force pushing up from the ground and the, and the reason that you're not either flying out into space or sinking into the ground is because the forces on your body are, are in equilibrium. And and when you're sitting, all the different muscles that are in place, what, one of my favorite accusations is, oh, you don't use that many muscles when you're riding a horse, you're just sitting there. No, you're moving every single muscle in the core of your body to balance as the thing you're sitting on is moving in all sorts of different ways. So 
um, it's that that concept of staying in equilibrium, staying in balance. But then when you start applying it across all the sciences, you find things like a balloon is something that's in equilibrium because the the gas inside versus the elasticity of the balloon versus the air pressure outside, all these different forces um, are are all in balance so that the balloon balloon is neither shrinking nor exploding. Now, what are some classic situations in in space and astronomy where equilibrium is really is really coming into play? And it's that loss of equilibrium that causes dramatic changes. I, I think probably the one that is most important uh, may be hydrostatic equilibrium in stars. Uh, this is of course a personal opinion. I'm sure someone else out there will say no, no, something else is much more important. But without hydrostatic equilibrium in stars, um, they can't balance out to have nuclear reactions. With a star you have the gravitational pressure that is um, causing the outer part of the star to try to collapse inwards, getting balanced by the light pressure pushing outwards from the core of the star. And it's this balance essentially between light pressure and gravitational pressure that allows stars to have such hot, dense cores that they can sustain nucleosynthesis. Sorry, Presta, if there's someone outside, I'm just going to close my window. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that is the strangest interruption. We, there is someone outside my window at night well, watching just a, us. Just record. a neighbor. No, no, just a neighbor who's like you know talking loudly in their backyard. <laughs> just coming into. I can see it in my recording. I'm like, oh, Preston's going to kill me. So sorry, um, Preston. <laughs> right. So, and when we first sort of talked about that, and when I first started to understand this concept that that it's it's the light pressure. Yeah from within the star that is what's counteracting the gravitational pressure, that, that blew my mind. Yeah, we, we generally call it radiation pressure, but uh, the word radiation masks the fact that, no, really, it's light. It's just light. It's, it's in all sorts of different energies, so not all of it is visible. Some of it is quite deadly, but it's the light that is supporting the outer layers of the star. And I think that uh, that original balloon analogy that you used at the beginning is really perfect because in the balloon, you've got the air molecules, you know, bouncing around wow. inside yeah. the balloon and that's bit balanced against the the elasticity of the of the rubber of the balloon. And the pressure outside the balloon. And the air pressure, right. Yeah. Probably more so the air pressure. But yeah. Um but but in but with the sun it's it's the photons of light bouncing around inside the sun pushing against atoms it's yeah crazy. and and gas gas pressure does play a role convective forces play a role but by and large it's that balancing between light pressure and gravitational pressure and as the star switches fuel mechanisms at various points in its evolution as it goes from burning hydrogen to burning carbon uh, there's helium in between those as it goes through all of these different burning stages it has to readjust to a new equilibrium as the temperature that's needed in its core and the density that's needed in its core to burn these heavier atoms um, is, is different. So every time it changes fuel source, it has to re-equilibriate. Re this is a show of words I can't pronounce well. Equalize, equilibriate, is that the word? I think so. We can just make up a word. <laughs> Equilibrify. <laughs> We're um, going to verb it. We're just going <laughs> to verb it. We're going to verb it, yeah. Uh, right, so you've got this situation, and, you know, and this is going on in the sun right now. You know, The sun is slowly heating up because it's using up this hydrogen helium fuel in its core and that's causing it to actually expand a little in the in the core more like pressure and it's you know it's and so it's kind of it pushes itself a bit mm -hmm. out of equilibrium but then you know there's only so far it can go and the gravity is pulling it back in and so you know ends well, back and in the spot my favorite case is in variable stars where they're in a periodically stable equilibrium and, and this is simply because they, they have a outer layer often of, of helium that uh, as the star starts to hit a new equilibrium point, it ionizes all the helium. So the energy goes not into pushing out on the star, but instead into ionizing the helium. 
Um, but as it continues to expand, as momentum carries it past an equilibrium point, it cools off and the helium, um, then the energy as it collapses goes into neutralizing the helium and uh, so you keep ending up with this push and pull as, as the helium ionization and neutralization plays a role in the pulsation of the star. That was extremely simplified. <laughs> and but it was very it, rhymey too, though. It, it was. Yeah. So oversimplified and rhymey describes uh, that description of variables. And if the, you know, as, as we've seen, like with supernovae, when the, uh, when the light pressure goes out, when the, when the supernova has gone and, and converted all of its elements all the way up to iron. You have a sudden lack of equilibrium. Right. You have a lack of light pressure. And, and in that case, when you wreck the equilibrium, when you pull the chair leg out and the force free body diagram is, is no longer in balance, the outer layers of the star collapse down, undergoing magnificent nuclear reactions as they go, and uh, explosions occur. Kaboom. Kaboom. And in the other way, in the red, in the red giant star, that's when, the, when really the, the light pressure takes over, right? Well, and you, depending on what stage you're looking at, you can have a helium flash when a shell of helium suddenly ignites around the, the core. Um, all these, these different things, um, or rather you end up with a helium flash in the core as you have a shell of hydrogen burning. Um, all of these different things can, can lead to the system suddenly changing in radius to balance everything out. Um, it's, it's similar in, in ways to what happens when you change the temperature of gas, for instance. If you have a balloon and uh, you heat up the balloon, the air inside of it is going to expand. The velocities of the gas increase, the pressures of the gas against the walls of the balloon increase. And so in order to compensate for this changing temperature uh, and this new pressure inside, the entire balloon expands. Uh, but if it expands too much, it'll overcome the el elasticity of the balloon structure and boom. So I think another great uh, example of this is the hydrostatic equilibrium that, that planets and moons and such face. And if they don't have enough mass, they, don't kind of, they can't pull themselves into a sphere. Yeah, this is this is gravitational hydrostatic equilibrium on um, a different scale and in a different way. So, in this case, when you have small bodies, the chemical structures, the uh, everyday bonds between the minerals, allow asteroids that look like potatoes. Basically, you have a chunk of matter; it gloms on, and yeah, gravity plays a role, but. At a certain point, they're also held together through chemistry. It's like when you're building a sand castle on the beach. The shape of the sand castle is determined by the individual uh, stickiness between the molecules and the particles of sand. Now, as that object gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the gravity that's trying to make everything round to make a surface with a equal gravitational potential everywhere on the surface, that gravitational pull towards an equal potential surface will start to over overcome the chemical bonds between the molecules. And this is where you get lands. This is where um, Earth can't have mountains as big as Mars can because on Earth, if you start building something like Olympus Mons, gravity is going to flatten it as, as our gravity seeks to create an equal potential surface. Yeah, from what I understand, like Mount Everest is pretty much at the limits yeah. of what, how big of a mountain that we can actually have here on Earth. And it's and no surprise that it's the biggest mountain on Earth. Exactly. And over time it will wear down and new mountains will emerge and we're always going to have that limit to how much forces of gravity can bend things held together through chemical properties and gravity won't squish them back down. Now where's that line? Like, like how big does an object have to be? How, how much mass does it need to have before... You know, it's it's likely going to have that that hydrostatic equilibrium. The the asteroid series is is about the limit of what we're looking at. So, it's it's a reasonable fraction of the size of the moon, um, but Vesta comes close. It's fairly round. So the largest of the asteroids are approaching that stage, and then Ceres, the largest of the asteroids, is a dwarf planet, and right. it 
meets the criteria by being in hydrostatic equilibrium. So I wanted to sort of go another direction and talk about something that's that's quite exotic because you know again I love these these opposing forces so for example like a neutron star uh-huh right you've got this situation once again it's gravity pulling it in it always seems to be gravity that's doing the the inward force but but now you've got you know neutron you, you, you've got oh, neutrons like, that are yeah, pushing back and it's de it's a degeneracy system. So with a white dwarf, you have an electron degeneracy pressure. This is where um, it's the force of the electrons against each other as the, the Pauli exclusion principle prevents uh, atoms from sharing the exact same um, spin and energy level. So all of the electrons have to configure themselves exactly right in a white dwarf so that um, they, they don't defy the exclusion principle and in this process they form um, basically one solid set of orbitals throughout the entire white dwarf and it's the electrons getting as close as they can without breaking the rules of physics that essentially supports the, the white dwarf. One big diamond, right? That's, that's when you start looking at the carbon atoms in a carbon rich white dwarf. Now when you put too much pressure on that degenerate electron gas, um, those electrons and the protons in the atoms that they were surrounded by end up joining forces. And an electron plus a neutron, uh, sorry, an electron plus a proton put tightly enough together is going to produce a neutron, a positron, and a neutrino. And a uh, positron flies away, neutrino flies away, um, and what you're left behind with is a neutron star that is, in this case, held together by the neutrons getting as close as they can um, before, in this case, other forces of physics are defied. Right. Well, I mean, it's the gravity pulling it together. It's the yeah. neutrons defining the limit of, of how small and how, you know, where, how big this object is going to be. And, and in this case, you have the neutrons getting together pretty much at densities not too different from what you have in a core of an atom. And the strong and the weak force are defining what happens when you create a neutron star. And it's when you break down those specific rules and the neutrons get smushed together that we end up with an exotic matter we don't even know what is and an object that we call a black hole. Right. And so if that, right, if the gravity just is too much, then even the neutrons can't sort of keep it in balance and it just turns into a black hole. And I guess the, the, the thing with a black hole is, I mean, do we know of any force that could be pushing against the gravity of the black hole pulling inward? No. Right. And so, <laughs> and so that could be, that could be this sort of a runaway limit at that point, right? Well, it, 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 I, I think, trying to speculate anything we can't really get away with at this point. It's a black hole. Physics breaks down as we move inside. I know you like to make things up. Um, but it's it, we can't define a form of matter that uh, would exist at sufficient densities to explain black holes. Uh, some people call it a quark soup. Other people say we don't know. Other people make up stuff like going through to other universes. No, no, that's not what's right. happening. Right. Um, so we just don't know. It's it's part of what makes science exciting. There's still things left to learn. And I think, you know, to go sort of to flip this whole conversation around, I mean, you know, if we imagine, you know, what is the breaking point or at what point does the gravitational force, it's too strong, there is nothing to push back against it and it just starts to collapse beyond what we could really understand. On the flip side, you know, the universe has figured out or has, you know, surprised us with dark energy as the opposite situation, which well, is a, a repulsive force that's seemingly continuing to, you know, expand the universe beyond you, gravity's ability to hold it back together. You have to be careful because we don't know if it's a force. We don't know... It, we know the effect that dark energy has, and the effect that dark energy has is it acts like a pressure. So it could be that dark energy is energy getting injected into the system. It could be that it's an actual field that is... is ex in, there's all sorts of stuff. We don't know. Sure, but I, but I think the, the sort of the, the outcome is the fact is that the universe itself isn't in equilibrium. That's true. 
Right. That, no, we are not in equilibrium as a universe, and that's right. that's disturbing. But yeah, within the universe, it's really kind of awesome how the entire tale from the way stars are formed to the way they die is one of our own uh, astronomical punctuated equilibrium, and in biology they talk about punctuated uh, equilibrium in terms of evolution and how pl how plants and animals change to fit a variety of niches but when we look out across the universe what we see is well because things weren't uh, perfectly smooth after the Big Bang and after the um, formation of the cosmic microwave background because we had a patchy distribution of matter um, it was able to find places that eventually came out of gravitational equilibrium and in this case it was gra it was gas pressure versus gravitational pressure and the gas collapsed down to form stars um, those stars over time went through their own phases of different levels of equilibrium as they went from burning one fuel to burning another to sometimes exploding or collapsing um, all throughout our, our structural evolution, we've seen galaxies collapse down into formation, we've seen uh, systems that, that became made into spheres due to, to disk-like things collapsing, and everything we have is the result of two things getting out of equilibrium and creating a new th thing in their wake. Right, right. And so I think one of the last sort of places where we see equilibrium is just in, in orbits, right? Again, with gravity pulling things inward, but then we have this, um, you know, centripetal force as, as things are going around in, in circles or in and orbits around these the, objects. The, <laughs> the, way, the way to think about it is um, centripetal uh, force is, is one of these artifacts that exists in appearance but gets messy when you try and define its reality. Yeah, momentum. What, what, what is actually happening is you have an object that is trying very hard to move in a straight line and there's nothing slowing the speed that it has but its path, its velocity is changing because its direction is changing. So gravity is working to constantly change the direction of an object that is moving at a speed that because orbits end up being ellipses may change as the object gets closer or further from the object doing the pulling but the bulk of what you see with orbits is is that direction ever ever constantly changing um, as the object's getting yanked on in a straight line yeah so. and and I mean there's a great example right of how to actually sort of mentally get yourself to to orbit where you know you shoot you know like a uh, cannonball out of a cannon and the cannon you know the cannonball shoots you know a few hundred meters down down range and then you shoot it harder and it goes further mm -hmm. and you shoot even harder and eventually you get it hard enough and it's going around so far that it's you know that it can't it never hits the ground it just keeps going right. around in orbit and so you've still got that gravity pulling this cannonball inward but then you've got its momentum trying to escape and it gets held in in this perfect balance its its velocity is trying to stay constant. The force is changing the velocity as it accelerates it along a curve, and uh, yeah, gra gravity always wins. But I always think about the the orbits of the objects in the solar system. Like think about how the planets are going around the sun in the same way for for billions of years. But if there was any instabilities in that orbit, if they weren't in equilibrium, they would spiral inward and crash into the sun. They would spiral outward and escape from the solar system. They would crash into other objects in the solar system. Like What I love is what you're thinking about is on such a limited time scale. The yeah. planets are, have, have orbits that are in equilibrium for the time scale of the human race. But in the past, we know they weren't in equilibrium. Yeah. We know that Saturn and Jupiter were in a resonance that flung Uranus and Neptune out much further than where they formed. Uh, we know that there is a period of heavy bombardment that was triggered by all of this as things careened all over the inner solar system, including an object roughly the size of Mars that hit Earth and generated our moon. Um, 
what we perceive as orbits in equilibrium simply means that right now nothing bad is apparently going to happen but the orbits are constantly experiencing small degrees of change uh, Mars in particular we can see how its poles migrate over time um, so there is constant change going on and the planets aren't in a true complete equilibrium yeah I take a look at say Phobos right Mar the Mars moon that's that's not in equilibrium and, and is, eventually it's going to crash into yeah the it's going to get torn up in the next you know 10 million years or so and and then get sort of impact the the surface of Mars and, and and our own moon is migrating away but the Sun will blast us to smithereens before it has a chance to escape I would love to see some kind of simulation of just like a time lapse a really sped up time lapse of like the future the the past and future of the solar system to see just like the positions of all of the the planets and the you know as they moved in and outward and things disappeared and moons drifted away and you know, and then the sun goes into its red giant phase, and you see what impact that has, and it turns into a white dwarf, and then just run that clock for trillions of years as whatever planets are left continue to orbit around the sun. That would be, that, that would, I think, that's what you're getting at, right? As you said, we have the sense of scale of just human history, but, but in fact, as you, if you play it out across the billions or trillions of years, then there's many more movements that are happening. Yeah, and, and creating that, that animation that you want is actually something that's not too difficult, but it's the type of thing that's extraordinarily hard to get funding to do, and you're really looking at one beleaguered PhD-level astrophysicist working very hard doing for a year, and then a programmer or two doing the graphics, so now you're looking at one year salary for three people, so your pretty animation would probably run about $300,000 once you factor in medical insurance and university overheads. Right. So if you find me the money, I'll make oh. you the animation. Awesome. Okay. All right. I will uh, not. <laughs> so, but thanks for the offer. <laughs> we'll just fake it instead. Uh, cool. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Pamela, and we'll talk to you next week. Okay. Sounds great. Sorry. That was just way too much fun to point out the actual producing that animation. It's like, yeah, I could do that. No, I don't have no, the time. No, no. Wait. The wait. Cost. That. Oh, yeah. wait. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Come on, you know, you know, it would like go viral. <laughs> Everyone would be like, you know. Yes, but again, that's the internet famous. Which yeah, is I know, I know, I know. That's thing. the thing. We'd be like, we'd be like, hey, check out this really cool <laughs> animation that Dr. Pamela Gay and her researchers created, showing the past and future uh, of the sun. And then, you know, the reality is, of course, it chewed up, you know, a year of your life. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm destitute and living on the sidewalk. Yeah, exactly. And all you can do is just mumble about about orbits and red giant stars. Yeah. Uh, no, that'd be great. I uh, I look forward to someone uh, coming up with that. Um, cool. I, seriously, I know exactly who I'd hire to do it. Oh, really? If we had the money, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to record again tomorrow at... Let me see if there's Early. any quick questions. Let me see. I looked at the time, um, and it hurt. Uh, Steve Perry says, great discussion, Fraser. Say hi to your neighbor for us. <laughs> your stalker neighbor. Oh, my stalker neighbor. Right, right, of course, my neighbor having their party outside. Yeah, I was like, wait, wait, what? Um, that's it. So uh, we're Dex recording Luther's tomorrow at yeah. 8 a.m. No, we're not recording at 8 a.m. I'm no. prepping at 8 a.m. 8 a.m. Yeah. Pacific. We're going to yeah. start recording at... Um, Wow, nine. there was a long time record set aside there. Okay, yeah, nine. Nine. So yeah. yeah. Okay, great. I will. Uh, I will put that in an event for that, and I will um, pitch a couple of topics at you tonight, and we'll and okay. then I'll make the event. So we'll we'll talk about this uh, off air. Okay. That Unless someone good. watching has a suggestion for a topic. No, I don't see any. <laughs> uh, not that I give them very Seriously, much time. Seriously. You, you. <laughs> Okay. Uh, people no want to know how I grew a watching. thick beard. Are you kidding? This is my, this is like two weeks, three weeks. Yeah. Fraser has Insta beard. It's yeah, really kind of amazing when you go on vacation with him. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I, uh, it's like him and Adam Levine. People are like, oh, I like your beard, but it's actually a pain. It's actually better to have it shaved because it's just kind of itchy and hot and it's summertime. So I, I'll probably be getting rid of it again in, in a couple more weeks. It, it does work well in all your videos. I will give you that. <laughs> yeah, there we go. 
Okay, cool. All right. Um, well, thanks again, Pamela. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Sorry we kind of messed up the time on this, and we just sort of threw this at you at the last minute. <laughs> Get used to it this week, uh, but I'll try and put more and more of the events in the uh, in the listing. So, But they'll all show up in the feed anyway. You can watch in, in the yeah. archive.